Hi, everybody. Can you guys hear me? I have headphones on today. I just want to make sure this is working before I go. Oh, yay. That's a heart. Okay, I think that means you can hear me. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining. Hello. Um, I actually had not planned on having any type of scope today. Um, I'm not yet at the point where I can say I'm brave enough to commit to doing this on a regular basis. Um, um, I really want to talk a little bit about colorism today. I live in Brooklyn and I call Brooklyn the Afro capital of the world, right? I mean, you guys have, I mean, this is my hair. Like I, I wore this to a business meeting yesterday. Like that, it is the Afro capital of the world. You can see natural hair all over the place. It's wonderful. And it's one of the reasons that my husband and I chose to move here. <clears throat> and raise our children here. Um, but as I'm going throughout my day, um, today I was on public transportation, so I was on the bus, and I saw these beautiful little black girls getting on the bus um, with their mom. You know, they were chilling with their little brother and mom. It was like a just wonderful little family. And they were just gorgeous girls, and they had cute little Afro puffs, and one of them had like hair with the beads. And I mean, they just looked great. And I'm like, oh, you know, that's beautiful, black love, okay, mwah. And then they pull out, out of their backpack, they pulled out some baby dolls right and I was kind of surprised because from the way they their hair looked it seemed like the dolls you would expect them to pull out were not the dolls that they pulled out so they pulled out these white baby dolls um, Barbie dolls with very very straight hair at first I was fine with it. it it didn't you know I didn't think too much of it. I mean literally I'm on the bus like what do I care what other people are doing but then I see the little girls with the beads in their hair start doing this, right? So they're playing with the dolls and they're like bouncing the dolls back and forth. And then they start doing this to make their hair flip and move like the baby dolls. Now, those of you who've been following me for a while, and if you haven't, you can join, you can get my website at afrostateofmind.com. Um, follow me on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. All of my handles are Afro State of Mind. Y'all who follow me know I'm fairly consistent when it comes to certain things and when it comes to issues about race. I'm a very consistent person in ideology and thought. I always allow room for expansion and for growth, but there are just some baseline, bottom line principles that we kind of just need to know and understand if we're going to be effective at dealing with or at creating a world where Black Lives Matter actually means something, right? Um, so I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm not going to say anything to this mother about the dolls because it's not my place. And quite frankly, it might be considered offensive. So even though I'm highly concerned and upset at this point that these little black girls who up until the time they pulled that baby baby doll out of their bag were looking like content, beautiful black girls. As soon as they had a doll in their hand that had hair that wasn't theirs, that was flipping back and forth, their entire body movement started to shift, right? They started mimicking and acting, hi, Celi, hi, thank you so much for joining. I really enjoy, appreciated your event, the Redefining Herstory. It was wonderful. Thank you so much for having that. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys do with Truth and Reality coming up. Um, so thank you for joining. Um, and it just, it seemed like the little girls were literally altering their body movement to mimic what this baby doll was doing, right? Um, that disturbed me. That disturbed me on a number of, I mean, I see it all the time. I see it every day. And Halloween is going to be coming up soon. They've already got the costumes out. And they've got, you know, I just know there's going to be a whole bunch of little beautiful black girls walking around with them damn blonde frozen wigs. Last year, it just killed me to see it. And I was like, all right, so we're just going to chill. I'm not going to say anything. I get off the bus and I'm disturbed, but you know, I got business to do and I got to get back to get the kids before daycare is up. So what a Goldilock. Yes. Goldilock hair. I can't, I can't. Can we not with the blonde wigs on a baby? I'm sorry. Whatever. Back to the story. Point being, I log on to Facebook later on and Jamila Lemieux, who is the, I believe she's the senior digital editor for Ebony. That's just the whatever she's doing, I support because all of her writings are wonderful. She's just, she's fabulous. I love the way her mind works. I love how she challenges people to think about race. And I really love that she is a black professional who uses her profession to really represent black people in a positive light, right? So she shares on Facebook this article called, uh, it was, what is it? Let me pull it up. Does skin color affect how you rate the intelligence of others? Does skin color affect how you rate the intelligence of other people? So I look at, I pull up the article, and I remind you, this is after I've been on the bus seeing beautiful little black girls who start moving their head like little white girls um, as soon as they pull out their white baby doll, right? And so I'm getting to colorism in a second. Work with me. Y'all know I firmly believe that colorism and hair issues are interconnected and intertwined. So I'm going somewhere with this. So I'm reading the article, and the article was actually talking about how white people, it was a measurement, it was a description of the measurement of colorism in the attitudes of white people. And now for those of you who don't know, colorism is the ideology that light skin, light brown skin has more value than dark brown skin, right? So it's kind of like racism, 
but it's within one grouping of brown people, right? So racism says that white people have, or white privilege rather, says, and white supremacy says that white skin has more value and white, and things that we associate with white people have more value, like the way they think, the way they talk, the way they move, the way they operate, those things tend to have more value than similar, um, than the counterparts in the black community, right? So white hair is considered better. White skin is considered better. Um, if you have hair closer to whiteness, then you are considered to have more value, right? So colorism is kind of that, and you know, racism is a system built around the ideology. Colorism is sort of that same thing, but within groups of brownness. So as I explain it to my students, if I, I can be a black person who is a victim of racism. I can live in a world where people set up a system where white people have more power than brown people. However, in that system of racism, as a lighter skinned black woman, I have privileges that my darker skinned brown sisters do not get to share. How they cast the movie, look, okay, Straight Outta Compton. I got some things about Straight Outta Compton. I can't put that in the Easter yet, but I'm just saying straight, exactly. Like for those of you who, the movie Straight Outta Compton had a casting call. It was like, we want all the women who look lighter than Beyonce. If you dark, I mean, that's not what they said, but that might as well be what they said. Like, if, you don't, if you're not as light as Beyonce, this casting call is not for you, right? Which is really interesting considering um, the culture and the time of what was happening when NWA came out, right? Um, but that's, like I said, it's a whole other topic. But yes, that's a very similar thing. So this article posted by Jamila Me, and it wasn't by, it wasn't an Ebony article. And in fact, I'm going to post it on my Facebook page, um, which is facebook.com slash Afro State of Mind. So if you haven't seen the article yet, I'm going to post it there and you'll be able to look at it. But it was talking about how within the system of racism, we have this social uh, system of this hierarchy where lighter skinned brown people have more value. And it was interesting because we all know that, like, we thank you, sis. I appreciate you posting that. Um, we all know that within that, that system exists. And we know this because from the time our babies are born, you have people in our community who are checking, like, their fingernail beds to see, oh, well, they're light now because most babies tend to be light at birth. But let me check the rims of their fingernail cuticles so I can see how brown they're going to be, right? It's kind of like hedging our bets. Or, you know, like, you'll have the aunties, the uncles who's like, oh, your baby's so cute. I love your baby. And then you can see them checking the kitchens in the back of the hair just to see like is that going to be nappy or is it going to stay baby hairs you gonna have a whole head full of baby hairs because if you have a whole head full of baby hairs and baby <laughs> baby hairs then you know you kind of set in some ways right but if you got this not so much right so you can have this and be loved but if you had this and it were straighter you have more value that's a difference. And we got to think about that because when we don't, we create these systems that don't address the fact that even within our, the oppressive system that we live in, there are levels of privilege, right? Like I have to acknowledge that as a lighter skinned black woman, I'm going through a whole lot with this head of hair and with this nose and these lips, but I'm not going through what my darker skin sisters are going through. We need to be able to acknowledge that and workshop that because if I can't acknowledge my privilege in an analogy that's sort of loose and doesn't really work perfectly, like I'm kind of like a white person who doesn't acknowledge my privilege, right? Or I'm like a man who doesn't acknowledge that there is male privilege over feet women, right? So I think we have to talk about that. It's very, very uncomfortable, very, very uncomfortable, but we have to be real about that. So for example, I run one of um, the programs I run is called the Awesome Girls Program. It's Afro State of Mind, um, but it's A-S-O-M, the initials, Awesome Girls, right? And it's a program that uses my book, Afro State of Mind, Memories of an Nappy Head black girl which you can get at my website afrostateofmind.com um and it's it's a program that literally is like a rites of passage program that helps black and brown girls transition um and deal head on with issues of race identity skin color and at a certain point in the program all of my staff um which were in one particular school i noticed that we all happen to be a particular shade of brown wasn't intentional, didn't plan it that way. It just so happened that in this particular school, thank you, I appreciate that. I think all of y'all are gorgeous too. I do appreciate that. Um, but in this particular school, my staff just so happened to look like me, which is light-skinned black women. Now, committed as all get out. I mean, I would ride or die with these sisters because they love the babies. They know how to reach the babies. They are from these neighborhoods. So it's not like, you know, they're gentrifying that workspace. But... If we're dealing with issues of skin color and hair texture, it's problematic for me as the director of that program to not make sure that my staff is reflective of the values that I'm trying to inculcate in my students, right? You see what I'm saying? I, I see the heart, so I, I know y'all with me, right? So we have to be aware of these things because they have impact in real life. So 
back to this article, again, posted by Jamila Lemieux, um, which is, does skin color affect how you rate the intelligence of others? And what the article reports is that in white communities, when white people are evaluating black and brown people, if you like skin, you are multiple times more likely to be considered intelligent, or better said, you are considered to be multiple times more intelligent, right? Um, this is important because these are the same people who make hiring decisions. These are the same people to whom you have to um, complain when you are treated unfairly at work. If you are inherently seen as untrustworthy, less intelligent, when you walk into your boss's door, simply because your shade of brown is a little more brown than mine, that's highly problematic. And it, the reason this bothered me so much, I guess maybe I hadn't thought about this had I not seen those little girls on the bus shaking their hair and trying to imitate white dolls who they'll never actually ever look like, right? Trying to get their hair to do something um, because those white dolls have more value. And you guys who have followed me for a while, you know that I talk a lot about the doll test. The doll test is very important. I'm going to explain it really briefly, but it's important that we know that we aren't the only ones who fail this test, right? So the doll test was a test conducted under the... Um, work of um, two psychologists, uh, Dr. Mamie Clark and her husband, Dr. Kenneth Clark. I say the two because people always say Dr. Kenneth Clark. They don't never credit Dr. Mamie Clark for doing that. They act like she was his assistant or something. I don't understand. But whatever, Dr. Mamie and Kenneth Clark. Um, so they're working on this test where they were essentially trying to determine what is the impact of living in a society that is sending racialized messages to black children, right? So how does it impact black kids when they grow up in a society that says, you ain't nothing, you ain't never going to be nothing, your daddy wasn't nothing, your mama going to be nothing, you was a slave, you was born a slave, you're going to die a slave, basically, right? What is the impact of that? Um, and so the test was very, very simple. They would place in front of children between the ages of three and seven years old two dolls, one white doll, one black doll. And the dolls were completely identically the same, except for the fact one was white and one was black. And they would ask the kids questions like, well, which doll is the smart doll? Which doll is the pretty doll? Which doll is the kind doll? Which doll is the nice doll? Which doll is the doll that everybody wants to play with? And the kids are picking over and above the white doll. Like, I mean, this is, you know, this is 1940 segregation, so it makes sense, right? And then you flip the questions and you say, which is the mean doll, which is the ugly doll, which is the dumb doll, the doll no one wants to play with? And black kids in the 1940s were picking the black doll. Makes sense. I mean, you've literally got signs that say no niggers, no spicks, no dogs allowed. Like white water fountain here, which is nice and pretty, and the black water fountain, if there was one, is some far place away, right? That makes sense to me. It hurt. Yes, it hurts. And I'm going to tell you why it hurts, because we didn't just leave that in the 1940s. So it makes sense in then. But then we have the black liber uh, civil rights movement. We have women's liberation. We have black empowerment. We've got Reaganomics. <laughs> we've got all of these advancements, we've got the birth of hip hop, we've got women's liberation, we've got the inauguration of President Barack Obama, who's the first black president. So someone might think that in the course of that time, we have seen progress, right? I'm not a fan of progress, and I'm going to tell you why in a second, but somebody would think that we had seen progress in that time. And what you find, a young woman by the name of Kiri Davis, if you go to YouTube, and um, on YouTube, there's a search for Kiri Davis. It's called, what is it, A Girl Like Me. Young sister in 2007, she was 17 at the time. She redid the doll test. She reintroduced it, redid it, filmed it, documented it, and everything is amazing. And what you find is that in 2007, black kids are still picking the white doll as the pretty kind, nice doll that's smarter, that everybody wants to play with. In 2007... Yeah, child, teachers, I know you teachers. If you are a teacher and you're dealing with this, I feel your pain. My husband and I, we run a company called Breaking the Cycle Consulting Services, and we teach teachers how to use the research on positive racial identity in the classroom. This is a huge issue in the classroom. Some of the things that you hear come out of there, aside from the fact that our kids are using the N-word like nobody's business, a lot of the things that you hear from in the classroom, I remember the first day of my program, bitch, you burnt. Yeah, you light and bright. Like every insult that these girls had for each other was based on skin color and hair texture. That's real. Like African booty scratcher is a bad word on playgrounds all across the country. Like I've lived, I was a military brat. I've lived in Germany most of my life, my young life. African booty scratcher is a term everybody uses and we only use it for black people. We never use it for white people because we have been indoctrinated with these ideals. Yes, still. Be on a playground and hear the kids talk to each other. Like if you... It's horrible and it's hurtful and it's painful to witness and it's even more painful when we don't have an analysis to understand it so that we can combat it, right? Um, so what was I saying? Anyway, so this study, it was interesting to me because it confirms that yes, white people see value in, whiter co in white color and they also see more value in lighter brown than in darker brown. But I think it's more important because my biggest thing is not what did slavery and colonization teach other people to think about us, but what it taught us to think about ourselves. Because I go back to the, yes. Oh, you never heard of Africa? <laughs> 
I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that I've introduced this horrible term to you. <laughs> um, but it's a phrase. It's a horrible phrase, and we use it. And this also speaks to why it is that there's often so many tensions between um, black students who are of the diaspora and black students who come from the continent and black students who come from the Caribbean. Yes, Haitian booty scrap. There was all these terms that we use to ridicule blackness, and we would never call a white kid African booty scratcher. I mean, if you have ever called a white, if you've ever heard of somebody being white called an African booty scratcher, please let me know, because I have never, in the hundreds of workshops that I've done, I've never had someone actually say that. Um, so yeah, so it's an issue, and it's more of an issue for us, because when I am trained to think that lighter brown is better than dark brown, and that white is supreme, I'm already firmly within that hierarchy that says I've bought into the ideology of white supremacy. Like, I've already been trained into thinking that whiteness is what I must have in order to be effective. And one of the things that always kills me about the doll test is that for those of you who play with dolls, were your dolls smart? Like, were your dolls kind? Like, were they peaceful? Were they mean? Like, were they dumb? These are inanimate objects, guys. <laughs> They're inanimate objects. Like, your doll can't be any of those things unless you infer those characteristics onto the doll. So it's important that we recognize that people aren't, the, these black children aren't looking at the doll and speaking specifically about their doll. They're saying that this doll represents something. And if you're asking me which doll represents the people who are good, that's not the doll that looks like me. That's problematic. That's problematic because if I think I'm less valuable and then I think people who look like me then are less valuable, I can shoot you a lot easier than I can shoot somebody who's not a part of my community. I can be willing to move out of my community and move into somebody else's community because I think their community is better and I'm not capable of thinking about how I can build up my own community because I don't see value in my own community, right? It's important because we have this situation where we kind of grow up, we go to college, and success for a lot of us means making it out the hood. But if we're all making it out the hood to work in these jobs where white people think we're less intelligent the more brown we are, then aren't we kind of shooting ourselves in the foot? Like, don't we need to think about, like, how we can understand colorism better so that we can heal what's happening? Because if we don't, then we kind of just get a world where no matter how many times we chant Black Lives Matter, it really won't because it doesn't matter to us, right? Like, I was talking to somebody about customer service in Black-owned businesses, and they were like, this is somebody who had kind of given up on the idea of shopping Black, and they were like, you know, every time I go to a Black-owned business, they're so rude, you know, and Caribbeans, I go to this store, and they're so rude, and... And I'm like, I get it. Like, I've seen that happen. And I've been in line where there's been a white person standing behind me at a black-owned business or someone black in the client, in the service position, and they will go to the white person behind me before the, even though I'm, like, physically in front of that white person. But we got to understand these things in context, right? That black person who's serving me has been taught that I don't have any value. Like, they've been taught that the money coming from the, that, there's a phrase, the white man's ice is colder. That means something. That comes from something. When you are taught for hundreds of years that you have no value, society will not ascribe any value to you and will not allow you access to those things that is deemed valuable, we got to think about that because that is going to infect our everyday interactions. It's going to infect the way we treat each other. It's going to infect who we choose to work with and who we don't. It's going to infect who we think is capable of having self-determining communities and who is not. And a lot of us have grown up and bought into the idea that in order to be successful, we have to find validation outside of our space. And for me, a lot of that comes back to the dolls we were playing with when we were young and the messages we were getting when we were little. And the conversations we're having at home and the aunties and the uncles who aren't getting checked when they're checking back behind the ears to see if their babies are going to get darker. And it happens when, you know, we allow some kids to play out in the sun and then we tell the other kids don't play out in the sun. You're going to get too dark. Like all of these things feed into this ideology that says in order to be successful, valuable of worth, I have to separate myself from the very people whom I call a part of my home. So those two things really shook me today. I really wanted to talk through. I needed to workshop some things. I was like, let me try this out on Periscope, see how it works. Um, I can see from the hearts that at least some of y'all are thinking I'm making some sense here. But I really just want to challenge us to be thinking about how we have allowed ourselves to really buy into some ideas that we were forced to accept during slavery. Um, and accepting them was sort of a, a, a survival mechanism. But we have to realize that a lot of what we call black culture are remnants of that survival mechanism, like they're remnants of things we had to do in order to survive slavery. And I'm going to be talking a lot about those things in the next upcoming scopes because just because it's black and it's cultural don't mean it's healthy. 
right? Like, it doesn't. Just because it's something we've held on to from the plantation. Oh, me too. My son plays. Okay, so who is it? This is unique, though. It's saying that she loves when her son gets darker from the sun. My son is in soccer camp. He comes home all nice and bronze and brown. I'm like, oh, I just love your beautiful brown skin. But those are the types of things we have to tell him. Like, I have to, I use those types of descriptive terms with my son and with my daughter. Like, I love your beautiful brown skin. Come here, my hand. Oh, I love your beautiful curls. Look at all your kinky, coily curls. Like, we have to be explicitly intentional about creating opportunities to demonstrate love for blackness in front of black children and in front of black people at every opportunity because there is a 24 seven machine that is telling them they're less valuable. There's a 24 seven machine that's like was reported in this article that is being kind of promoted as we breathe. And, and it's important that we deal with that. It's important that we think about that because that's really the only way to make black lives truly matter. They have to matter to us first. And if they don't, then we'll still be waiting on people who have never historically shown the capacity to see us as human and to see our value and our genius as African people. Um, we're waiting on them to help us, and we can't do it. Affirm your black students. Yes, they do. They absolutely do. They absolutely do. So thank you guys for joining. Um, at some point, once I get my life organized, I may have a regular schedule for these kind of chats because I, I really like them, and I'm glad you guys do too. And thank you so much for joining. If you want to find out more information, um, if you want to see more of what I talk about, you can go to my website, afrostateofmind.com. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Afro State of Mind. I will save this clip. Yes, I will say I'm going to load this to my YouTube page after I do my one from yesterday, which is six lessons black protesters need to think about. Uh, but you can go to my YouTube page, uh, which is um, youtube.com slash Afro State of Mind. Um, and these will both be loaded up hopefully before the end of the weekend. All right. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. And yay, live long and prosper. Shop black, love black and enjoy the blackness that you have. Peace. Now, if I could figure out how to turn this thing off.